This is one of those days that can evoke all sorts of emotions. Some of us celebrate a mom we love and one we can get our arms around. She may be sitting right next to you right now and that's a beautiful thing. Some of us remember a mom who is gone. Some of us struggle with a mom we're in conflict with today. Some of us long to be a mom uh, and it's not happening. Well, if you came to Hope today looking for a, a detailed sermon on the doctrine of atonement or a discussion of the messianic prototype of Melchizedek in Genesis 14, you are going to be very disappointed because today I'm going to talk about my mom and I'm going to unpack her favorite, good, I'm going to unpack her favorite Bible passage. My mom, my mom was something else. Mom was born... Uh, Modell Marie Johnson in Cotton Plant, Arkansas in 1916. But she grew up right here in Memphis. She went to Roselle Elementary School. She went to Bellevue Junior High, went to Central High School. Her dad left when she was pretty young, and, and so it was just mom, her younger sister Ruth, and my grandmother, Hucky. Uh, that's my mom on the right. That is Hucky in the middle, my grandmother, and that's my Aunt Ruth on the left. They worked very hard to survive during the depression years of the 1930s. My, my grandmother worked as a sales clerk at a department store in downtown. And my mom and Aunt Ruth, although they were just teenagers, were interestingly enough professional dancers. Um, this uh, picture, that's my mom on the right. I know, right? It's 1933, and mom is 16, and her sister Ruth is 14. Now, here's another one. Not sure where this was, but they danced regularly in the Skyway Room at a new hotel in Memphis called the Peabody. They, they traveled a good bit, too. They uh, danced in Chicago and New York. In the mid-30s, they were rockettes at the Radio City Music Hall. Okay, in this next picture, I love it. I'm not sure what mom's doing here, but here she is doing it right there. <laughs> and it's a great picture to me. By 1940, they had opened a dance studio on Overton Park, on the corner of Overton Park and Evergreen in Midtown. And by that time, she had married the love of her life, Eli Thomas Morris Jr., a graduate of Tech High School who was working for Murdoch printing company. That's a wedding picture uh, of them. Something else happened about that time. Because when dad got back from the Navy, they started going to church. Now they'd been to church before, but they would tell you that they had never really made a personal faith commitment to God. And when they did, everything changed. When my brother David and I were growing up, because of her dancing history, Mom really nurtured the creative in us, music in the house, art lessons. We'd act out TV shows. I, I, was, a, I was a big Superman fan. I'd put on my blue pajamas and pin a cardboard S on my chest. I'd tie a towel around my neck. I'd put my underwear on the outside of my pajamas. <laughs> By the way, there's a photograph of that somewhere, but fortunately, I was unable to locate it. We lived on the corner of Vern and Ivy in Colonial Lakers. And I'll never forget, I tried to jump off the storage room one day in my Superman gear. I was totally convinced that I could fly and I convinced my little brother to do just the same. And we both nearly broke our necks. I'll never forget, my mother ran out the door and I think the th first thing she thought of was, how am I gonna tell all my friends that both my boys died with their underpants on the outside of their... <laughs> But here's what she said. She looked down and she saw that we were okay. And she said, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Well, today I'm going to remember mom by looking at her favorite passage of scripture. It's all about what we should be thinking. Here's mom's favorite passage. It's from Philippians 4. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble... Whatever is right, whatever is pure, 
Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. So what are you thinking? Here's what the Apostle Paul says we should be thinking about. First of all, we need to think about things that are true and noble. Things that are true and noble. Truth has become a little fuzzier these days to me. Fake news, uh, alternative facts are brand new concepts to me. I, I didn't know those were things. But Paul says we need to be very committed to thinking about truth. In fact, in Ephesians 6, he says this. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. He also talks about thinking about things that are noble, things of a higher degree than the base or the gutter we sometimes find ourselves in. It's about character, really. There is a very beautiful proverb that is often read on Mother's Day. It's Proverbs 31, and it's usually titled The Virtuous Woman. And here's uh, one verse from that proverb. Proverbs uh, 31, verse 10. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Noble character. And don't let the word noble scare you off either. You can be pretty common and still be noble. Mom didn't come from much. She came from a line of Arkansas sharecroppers. But like I said, you don't have to come from much to still be noble. Nobility is about love and character and confidence. Three things my mom had in abundance. This is one of my favorite photographs of all time. Let me show you my noble mom in action here. Now, what, what you're seeing here is if you can't tell what's going on, I'm about 14 months old, and I am posing with Santa. But if you look closely, you'll see my noble mom <laughs> hunkered down in the sleigh, holding her screaming son up for the photo. That is common nobility right there. So what can you think on today that is filled with truth and nobility? Think on those things. Paul also reminds us to think on things that are right and pure and lovely. Things that are right and pure and lovely. Paul says, think about doing the right thing. You know, most of us know the exact right thing to do in most situations, don't we? We're bright enough to do that. Unfortunately, our minds are often conjuring up wrong things. But see, we should be thinking righteously. In Psalm 106, it says this, blessed are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Uh, how many of you here today have, have heard of the internet? The internet, anybody? Okay. Last week, Jessica gave us some super ideas about living out our faith in our social media-driven culture. And along with her encouragement to engage our culture through social media, she gave us a strong warning about some of the dangers of technology because there is some serious craziness that happens on the internet. And it's not pure and it's not lovely. But Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And then James says that when we, we recalibrate our minds toward purity, it results in us doing something. It results in actions in James 1.27. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So think about things that are right and pure and, and lovely. The word lovely only shows up four or five times in all of Scripture. It shows up in Mom's passage. And here's another occurrence that I've always really liked. It's from Isaiah 52. It says this. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him 
who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. That that is one positive passage, right? How lovely are the feet of him or her who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness. In your circle of friends, do you have a friend like that? Or are you that kind of friend? Are you that kind of friend, one who brings good, happy, peace-filled news? Because I'm going to tell you this, if you are that person, you will never lack for friends. Three more things to think upon. We need to think upon whatever is admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. My mother's faith was such a real and practical faith. It was very admirable. It wasn't judgmental. It was attainable. I know so many people who reject Christianity simply because they just don't think they can pull it off. Mom's faith was an attainable faith. Paul is writing to his young disciple Timothy when he says this in 2 Timothy 1. He says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded, now lives in you also. You see, faith has a way of being passed down. Now, at some point, we need to own our own faith, but we can come from a heritage of faith. And let me make sure you understand something here. Mom's faith was not admirable and excellent and praiseworthy because everything went just so perfect for her. Because it didn't. As I said, she was, she was born into poverty. Her, her dad left at a time when it was exceptionally difficult for three women to make anything that approached a living wage. And then her heart was broken when she, when she couldn't have children. Six miscarriages. And when she was on the operating table for a hysterectomy, the doctor stopped the procedure, removed some scar tissue, and sent her home. And I was born uh, a little over a year later. And my brother was born four years later than that, a month before her 42nd birthday. Here's what a legacy of faithful women can do for you. Look at this picture. If you grew up in Memphis during a certain time frame, you have a picture like this. <laughs> that's my mom on the left. Then that's me in that killer shirt. <laughs> that's my brother David and Hucky. Now, David was one. He was born prematurely, but he looks like he caught up very nicely. <laughs> and on the point of my ears... Don't be haters, okay? <laughs> My mama got them tacked back a couple years later. But I'll tell you, in that picture right there, I could hear conversations in Collierville from the zoo. <laughs> when I think about women in Scripture who exemplify this admirable, excellent, praiseworthy life, of course, I'm drawn to Jesus' mother. This passage is called the Magnificat, and it's Mary's prayer from Luke 1 when she learns that she's carrying Jesus. And she says this, she says, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Okay, so here's how this Philippians 4 passage ultimately breaks down. Think about good stuff and quit filling your head with bad stuff. And why was this mom's favorite passage? I think it's because she wanted the best for me and for David. Because see, when we do what this passage encourages us to do, we become people who sleep well. Now that seems super trivial until we can't sleep because of all the chaos in our lives. Have you been there? Yeah, me too. But think about this, when, when our minds are flooded with things that are true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy, guess what? 
we sleep better. We also become people who can laugh. My mother loved to laugh more than any person I've ever met. My love of laughter comes from her. Okay, remember this photo from earlier? This next photo just surfaced in the last year or so. I'd never seen it. It's a candid photo that followed the, the picture you're looking at, and I love it. <laughs> I, 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 that's how I will always remember mom, laughing. One more thought. When we do what this passage encourages us to do, we become people who show mercy. We become people who show mercy. My mom lived in a very judgmental time, both in her society and in the church. There are two things in her life that she never shared until the very end of her life, and here's the first one. Because of the church culture she came to know, she never ever spoke of her dance career, ever. To dance or to go to movies or to play cards or any other number of things was not Christian. So mom's beautiful dance career was hidden. That is until her funeral. And dad and David and I pulled out all the dance photos you've seen today and more and laid them all out for everybody to see. And then we pitched a little attitude like, you got a problem with this? Because if you do, we got a problem with you. Here's the second, and I'm going to try to tell this story this Mother's Day, but I've, I've had trouble doing it. Mom was just a, a few weeks from passing when she told me she needed to tell me something. It freaked me out. I thought maybe she'd been a spy in World War II or <laughs> that my dad wasn't, wasn't my dad. I didn't know what, you know, I mean, she's 85, man, told me something. But here's what it was. When mom was about 17 or 18, she went to Chicago for a couple of months to be taught a new tap dancing technique. It was very complicated, low to the floor technique. It, it helped her get the rocket gig ultimately. But here's why she had never told a soul about her summer in Chicago. Her instructor that summer was a black man. In 1934, a young white Memphis girl would have brought great shame upon herself and her family if anyone ever found out that she had gone to Chicago to be instructed by an African-American man. And so she never told anybody but my dad until she was 85 and she told me. Those two stories, the fear of a judgmental church and the fear of a judgmental society helped to shape her life of mercy. She was afraid that she would not be shown mercy, which I think made her show mercy to other people, including me. The Apostle Paul takes the words right out of my mouth. When in Philippians 3, he writes these words for my mom. On this Mother's Day, I thank my God every time I remember you. And that I do. Let's pray together. On this Mother's Day, we thank you for the gift of moms. Father, I thank you for the moms in this room and for the moms that we are missing today. I thank you for my own mother and her loving sacrifice for me, for how I continue to see her in myself and in my children and even in my grandchildren. We pray for relationships with our mothers that may be strained. And this day only amplifies the pain. We pray for strength and courage for our single moms. We pray for hope for our moms who worry about their children today. Father God, help our moms to feel precious in your eyes today. 
And may we all take a lesson from Philippians 4. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. In the strong name of Jesus, the Christ, we pray. Amen.